I think. All right, here we go. All right, we're live here at the station of decapitation without your head. I'm Nasty Neal. That would make me terrible, Troy. I'm Treacherous Trista. And we're joined by award-winning filmmaker and Amazon number one best-selling author, Stacey Lane Wilson of womeninhorror.com. It's very cool to have you here. Hey, don't I get a cool nickname? Hmm. What Do you have one of mine? Stacy. Well, spooky Stacy. Spooky oh, Stacy. All right. Clearly. Yeah, probably works. <laughs> I got to fit in. Yeah, hey. cool. I'll add that into the banner. <laughs> very fitting. So uh, first of all, when did uh, when women in horror.com, when did you, uh, when did that first start? Uh, I started that a couple of years ago, um, right around the time that Jason Blum said he couldn't find any female directors. <laughs> and I was going to make it into more of a kind of a directory site for women directed films and women directors. Um, but then it just kind of morphed into more of a film review and book review site. And I have a few contributors that write for me. So that's where the site is at right now. And honestly, I was shocked that the uh, URL was available when I looked it up. I was like, wow. <laughs> so I snapped it right up. And so it's just kind of a work in progress, but uh, it's definitely gaining some traction these days, which is nice. Uh, since then, over these last few years, uh, do you think uh, there have been more uh, women uh, directors that, have, that are out there? Oh, definitely. Yeah, I really think also that, uh, especially in the genre, you know, you see a lot of, of course, a lot of first time directors do get their start in horror, regardless of their gender. So I'm seeing a lot of that. Um, but it is nice to see kind of a different uh, sensibility with some of these films. And um, yeah, I'm seeing a lot more female DPs, female composers, you know, so it's good. I don't know if they're just more visible now because everyone's talking about it, but I feel that it's not. I think more women feel like they can direct and write and edit and shoot horror films now because they're seeing a lot of others doing it. And it's a really good thing. Uh, you said, you know, some people don't, uh, that's their first thing they do is direct a horror movie if they're not necessarily a horror, you know, person. But uh, I assume you've always been a horror person. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I uh, actually wrote some horror novels back in the 90s and then I became um, a reporter for Fangoria and for horror.com, which is now defunct, rest in peace. Um, you know, Sci-Fi Channel, I was their red carpet reporter and I covered a lot of horror for them. So I've been at it for, I don't even wanna say how many, how many years, but I think I'm going on like 21 years as a film reviewer and reporter. Was there any resistance at that time, um, a woman in, in horror? Uh, some people commented on it, you know, saying, well, like, why do you like horror films? Or, you know, isn't that, you know, aren't you squeamish and whatnot? But I actually did sometimes get, um, uh, you know, on message boards back then for my reviews, you know, some people would say, oh, you're a woman. What do you know about horror films? And, you know, the haters. But, uh, you know, certainly never had any issues at all with being hired. Um, always very welcoming. Uh, the, the community's always been great in terms of uh, people that hired me to be a reporter or a writer and whatnot. So I've been pretty lucky, I think. Yeah. Now, uh, Trista uh, set this interview up. So th thanks, Trista. But uh, when, how do you guys know each other? Oh, well, we met at a party. <laughs> oh, all right. So we did the whole story. Best as a mouse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just as the mouse from Echoes of Fear, specifically. Not every to everyone else, I was just a mouse. <laughs> yeah, I think I was Sister Morphine that year. Oh yeah, that was so fun. <laughs> that was really fun. A lot has happened since then. It like, has great indeed. memory. Yeah. Well, it's great to see you here, and uh, I, I love your podcast. So once again, thanks for having me on. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And actually, I actually, I think I had seen you around town at Dark Delicacies and Aaron as well. And I think we had some book signings that were coinciding. So we were running in similar circles for a little Probably. while. Probably. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. A lot of the, the, well, there's so many great, uh, you know, female centric horror film festivals in LA prior to the pandemic, of course, but Shriek Fest and, um, you know, the, uh, it's a screen fest, of course, is run by Rachel Belofsky. And so there's a lot of really good film festivals that I'm sure we were both at. I mentioned you, author and, and uh, director, when you're, and you also wrote a lot of the movies, 
Uh, what's the difference between writing a novel and writing a screenplay? Uh, well, I, I feel like a screenplay is much easier for me. I can write one in about a week, <laughs> which is nice. I can't write a novel that quickly. It does. You really have to um, think of every little thing in a novel and you have to go into the inner thoughts of the character and you have to really plot it out to make sure that, that it all makes sense to me. Um, the screenplay format is just much more immediate to be writing it in the present tense. And as you're thinking it up, you can be typing it out. So for me, it's easier, but um, you know, they're both storytelling forms and uh, I like both of them. Is uh, Do you like to direct your own things that you write? Uh, I do. Yeah, sure. Um, I have yet to uh, direct something that someone else wrote. So I guess I don't have much of a, a basis. Of yeah, compare it. Right, right, right. Maybe you'll find out in reverse that you like that better. I don't know. Yeah, well, I, you know, a short film that my writing partner wrote called Not With My Daughter. I did that. That was a very wry comedy. But I'm so familiar with his voice since he is my writing partner that that was almost like directing something of my own. So uh, you have some books coming out uh, if you want to talk about them. I do. I have a series of books uh, that I'm working on right now. They haven't okay. actually... Uh, not a word is typed yet, but it's oh. called Rock and Roll Nightmares. And it's, uh, you know, when bad things happen to good bands. So I've got some guest writers who are going to do be doing some short stories. And it'll be a lot of fun. We have, it's a horror comedy series. So it'll just be sky's the limit. And I'm really looking forward to that. Um, but right now I have a vampire uh, series out called the Immortal Confessions series. And there are two books out now, and there will be two more books coming out this year. So it'll be a total of four. And uh, where will they be available? Amazon? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and also uh, audio. So I have two oh, wonderful nice. audio I books. I walk a lot, and I like to listen to audio books when I'm walking. Oh, they're fantastic, yeah. So um, that is definitely a great way to consume those books. Uh, who, who does the reading for them? Uh, that would be Graydon Schlichter and Leanne Rowe, and they are super talented. I was just listening to their latest uh, chapter because they're giving me one chapter at a time as it's coming together. And really, they're more than narrators. They're actors. They really bring the story to life. It's always the best. It's but, you know. really fun to listen to because yeah. it's, you know, uh, dual voices, which I think is pretty cool. Yeah. And th this seems obvious, but if you listen to an audiobook and they're not great readers, it's not, it's not, it could be the greatest book, but it, it really takes away the entertainment of it. It can be, you know, I remember listening to the, I don't know if you're familiar with the Spencer for Hire, uh, yeah. you know, that it was like a detective novels in the nineties. And I remember listening to the audiobooks of those and the person that read them had a terrible list. So to say Spencer over and over again, <laughs> listening, it really got on my nerves. So little things like that, you're right, they do matter. Yeah. Uh, Tristy, you have a question? When you're listening to chapters uh, that you're getting back from your actors or your readers, are you directing them? Are you sending notes back? How does that work? Uh, well, no, I give them some notes initially, and then I let them run with it. But if there's something in there that I would like changed or something like that, for instance, in one of the books, I had used some actual lyrics and I thought, okay, I don't want to get sued. So let's cut that part out. <laughs> Things like that, where they, they are able to edit. Um, but no, I really haven't had anything that I've wanted them to change because they're just really intuitive. Um, in fact, uh, Graydon read one of my other books, a short story collection which is kind of a love hate letter to LA called city of devils. And he read that one. So I've been working with Graydon for a while and um, yeah, it's just a really great collaboration. How long of a process is that to uh, finish an audiobook? book? Um, well, it kind of depends on the narrator's um, workload. I mean, these two are very popular, <laughs> so they're doing some other books while they're doing mine. So it does take a few months and, you know, it's very meticulous, uh, process too because they do have to edit some things together and certainly make sure that the sound is perfect and then it gets uploaded to audible.com and then it goes through a quality control check and the whole bit so it does take a while um what what first interested you in horror pardon what first interested you in horror what was it about horror that you know uh, made you a horror fan Oh, it was that guy sitting next to Trista there, mm. <laughs> Vincent Price. 
Yeah, I saw the pit and the pendulum when I was a little kid. My dad actually let me stay awake to watch it, and I was just captivated, and I loved it. So that's really that's the beginning. So, so, that, so your family was supportive of uh, you pursuing horror. Oh, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, they both enjoyed it. In fact, my mom took me to see The Exorcist when I was way oh, too nice. young. Nice. And then she would tease me with that voice. <laughs> and I'm like, wow, this is not good parenting. <laughs> turned out fine. Yeah. <laughs> I think so. Yeah. Well, that's very similar. I was watching horror movies since I was a little kid. So. Yeah, yeah, they're good. Well, they certainly do. Uh, open up the imagination, which is maybe why I became a writer and a filmmaker in part. All right. Uh, Tristan, you have another question? You're such a prolific writer and you write so much. I, I was astounded at the amount of books that you have written. Do you ever suffer from writer's block? And if you do, how do you deal with that? Uh, no, I wouldn't call it writer's block exactly. I would call it um, severe procrastination syndrome. <laughs> you know, it's like I think of every possible chore that I can do before I sit down to write. But, you know, once I dive in, I absolutely love it and I get lost in it. But that's the thing is I like to be able to set aside a lot of time um, to be able to write. So I'm not the kind of person who can just like grab a few paragraphs here and there at a Starbucks. You know, I really like to get my mind focused on what I'm doing. And I can you tell us about the movie Cabaret of the Dead. Yes. What about uh, it? <laughs> well, first tell people what it is and where they can uh, uh, see it, and then we'll uh, talk about it. Oh, okay. Uh, well, it's a uh, it's a zomcom, so it's a, a sort of romantic, wild uh, zombie comedy, and it takes place in a post-apocalyptic Hollywood and uh, it's bloodthirsty zombies against sexy cabaret dancers and so it's a lot of fun it's a huge ensemble cast and just yeah I saw a lot of people uh you know I know from doing the show Alyssa Dowling Tristan Risk and yeah great cast. oh yeah yeah no uh yeah great you know to have a lot of friends come together to help me with that uh Michael Bean the actor he he uh he's uh you know, he, he owns that uh, production company. So he's the producer and his wife, Jennifer Blanc, starred in it. And she's really great. Um, so it's really a, for a first feature directing experience. It was kind of a, you know, a huge undertaking. And we shot it in five days. <laughs> so that's their model. They're like, yes, you, every movie is shot in five or six days on our roster. So I, do, I dove in and I got it done. Uh, what were some of the things that you didn't foresee being harder about uh, making a feature than making a short? Mm, I don't know. I can't, you know, I guess for most of my shorts, there were only a few cast members. In some cases, you know, only one cast member on screen at a time. Um, but as an entertainment reporter over the years, I've been on dozens upon dozens of sets all over the world watching movies being filmed and watching other directors at work. So I already knew what to expect. Uh, was there any directors that come to your mind that like being on set, you know, helped you get ready to be a director yourself? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I have to say that everyone kind of has a different style, but I did not encounter very many directors who treated their cast badly or, you know, were jerks or anything like that. I mean, some of them were quite arrogant, <laughs> you know, like, I had a lot of fun actually on the set of one of Remy Harlan's movies and he had this kind of a big bullhorn and he would announce to the cast, he'd say, this is the voice of God speaking. <laughs> so I didn't do that. I was going to ask, is that, yeah, is that one of the things you think that? that work, no. I'm going to write that one down. <laughs> You know, we showed uh, psychotherapy in our um, our virtual uh, festival, Severed Limbs, with uh, Brooke Lewis Bellas, who I understand you've worked with a few times. Uh, when when did you guys meet? Um, let's see, we met at an award show. I cannot remember which one it was, but it was one of uh, Dread Central's events, and I was working for Dread Central at the time, and I met her there, and we just really hit it off, and we were friends for. A few years and then started working together and she's in a lot of things that I've done um, including books she contributed a short story for my next book so we do a lot of things together um, we're just very compatible and we can almost read each other's minds um, 
And she's in my next movie coming up, which is not horror. It's a sci-fi rock and roll comedy. So that's going to be a lot of fun too. So, so you like to do a lot of uh, comedy in, in the genre, if it's sci-fi or horror. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I do. Is that hard to, I don't, you know, I, I think sometimes when it works, it's great, but is that hard to do to, to, to combine the comedy with, uh, with genre? Uh, well, you know, I've tried to not be as comedic in my writing, but it just comes through. And sometimes I don't even realize it's there. And, you know, people will be reading something else. Oh, this is really funny. I'm thinking to myself, wait a minute, I didn't mean for that to be funny. So I guess I really can't fight it. So now I'm kind of really leaning into it and just kind of making that my thing. Uh, Tristy, you have another question? I was actually really struck by the humor in your work as well. And I was wondering if you had ever done stand up. Oh gosh, no, <laughs> I could not ever put myself out there like that. I'm a writer at heart. I like to be uh, at home behind my computer, uh, you know, without other people around. So no, that's really not for me. Although I must say I do admire those who do and I enjoy going to the comedy club. Uh, by the way, Cabaret of the Dead, is that available uh, for people to, to get currently? Uh, I believe it's on Voodoo, uh, but I'm not sure because I know that it's just ended its run with the distributor. So they're looking to see about getting it out there again. Um, so hopefully people can find it somewhere. Um, might be on YouTube too for rent, but honestly, I, I'm not sure. It did come out a few years back. Right. Uh, how about Shevenge? Can you tell us about Shevenge? Oh, yeah, that is uh, a horror anthology that I produced, and it's all female directed. And I gathered some short films together, to, all on the uh, theme of revenge. And um, it's, it's a fun one. It's on uh, Amazon Prime and Voodoo and uh, Binge Horror Channel. Um, but the main thing that I'm um, proud of in regard to that is the fact that all the proceeds go to the Time's Up Legal Defense Fund. So it's a charitable project. How did you go about finding uh, the people to get involved on it? You know, I have to say that, um, give a big thanks to um, Heidi Honeycutt, who's a friend of mine and a festival director, and she knows everybody in the business and she's always been a major champion of women in horror. And so she was aware of quite a few of the shorts that were available and um, put a couple of mine in there. And then I also belong to a women's filmmaker group. And I just asked there, if, you know, any international directors would like to get involved. And I got a few submissions and that's how it happened. Uh, I knew, I, cause I saw a lot of names there that, you know, I know from the festival scene, like Izzy Lee, uh, I'm in Massachusetts and she lives up in Boston. So I oh, got, she's about. so talented. I was, I gotta say, I was super thrilled when she said yes to including her film because, you know, like I said, it's a charitable thing. So there's no pay for the directors. They understand that the proceeds are going to be donated to the me too movement. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I was just really happy because she's, just one of the most talented filmmakers that I know, and hopefully she'll keep on going and do features. Yeah. Uh, Tristan, you have another question? Do you have any advice for aspiring creators? Um, yes, create. <laughs> that would be my advice. I mean, a lot of people wait for that perfect moment or the big break. Um, a lot of times you just have to create your own luck. And in doing that, you have to write that book. You have to make that short film. You have to, you know, put together that reel if you're an actor. So I say just do it. That actually comes up a lot. And it seems like kind of simplistic thing. But, you know, like, like you said earlier, sometimes uh, it's not writer's block, but uh, you're procrastinating. But if you just think of something, it never it never exists. But if you, you have to actually make it for for it to happen. Exactly. Yeah, no, I know a lot of people who are just, you know, they're waiting for the financing or they're waiting for that perfect headshot or they're waiting for that inspiration to strike. But I feel like you just have to do it. Even if it doesn't, maybe your first try at a script isn't going to get made, but at least you've got the creative juices flowing and the ball rolling, basically. The first short or the first feature, or the first short you made, like, uh, what was that process like? And like, was that was that something you really had to push yourself to, to get made? Uh, I don't know. I mean, it was something that was kind of self created. You know, I got inspired by Edgar Allan Poe's uh, poem, uh, Annabelle Lee. 
and I was friends with Ogre at the time who had been in um, Repo, the genetic opera. And yeah, and I just really loved his look and I thought he would make a great Edgar Allan Poe. And so he he acted in it and it's a, a triptych of three different stories. And it's very artistic, you know, it's kind of Maya Deren-esque, you know, it's, it's uh, beautiful oceans and sunsets and strange imagery. So um, that that's what that one's about. And there was no, you know, dialogue except for his recitation of the poem. So it was a good way to, to break into it. But yeah, there were a lot of exteriors in that one and working, um, you know, by the ocean with the waves crashing in and you'd have to wait for the sun. And, you know, there's a lot of that. So it was, you know, definitely a good challenge for me. Do you do your own editing? No, <laughs> I don't. I did. I actually, I did edit that one, but I didn't really want to. I don't know why I did it, but <laughs> now I work with an excellent editor who's actually a super talented animator as well. And she oh. is my go-to girl for, you know, forever. So uh, during this last year, obviously, it's uh, different than most years. So what have you been doing? Writing. <laughs> lots and lots and lots of writing. And also doing some ghost writing. You know, that's one of my side gigs that's certainly more lucrative than selling my own things, quite honestly. You know, people hire me to write screenplays. And right now I'm working on one about uh, killer snakes. <laughs> so that someone hired me to do. And that's really fun too, because you kind of get to live in someone else's mind and, and, you know, create something that they're going to love, but also something that I can be proud of. Well, how does that work exactly? Like, uh, you don't have to go like really detailed, but do they come up with the idea and then you, you flesh it out as an actual. Uh, exactly. Uh, yeah. Yeah. For instance, this person is um, not an English speaker. And so he wanted a screenplay that's written in English and perfect English and he wants to shop his idea around but he didn't feel confident enough to write it himself but it's he gave me a lot of details and you know the whole three act structure to work from which is great very cool and uh, for people interested you know wh where would they go to uh, find out about that uh, actually, yeah, that's a, thanks for asking because it's kind of a new thing. I never actually put it out there until recently. People would just approach me and say, hey, do you do this? And I'd be like, yeah. So now I put together a little list on the womeninhorror.com website. So there's film services and also book services because I design book covers too. In fact, the one behind me is one that I recently oh, really? designed. Do you, yeah. do, you do the graphics? Yeah. Very cool. I like that one, by the way. Thank you. Yeah, I just recently rebranded that book. It's an older book, but the previous cover was pretty minimalistic. So I thought I would go for a little more gusto. It works. It's standing out right now. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Trust, you have another question? So uh, you're from L.A. and I feel like Hollywood and L.A. are major themes in your work. Um, I'm wondering... Uh, what else really inspires you? Um, what else? Well, I always feel like uh, history and glamour and uh, of course rock music is my big thing because my dad is a musician and I, I came of age in the 80s on the Sunset Strip with all the rock bands and stuff. So I love that. And I've just always been a, a huge music fan. So I think that my next project, Rock and Roll Nightmares, is really going to be something that I'm going to enjoy diving into because the books all take place in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. So it's all like just, when, you know, when music was good, as we say, you know, previous to auto-tune and all that. So so it should be a lot of fun. But no, I just love history. I'm really inspired by um, all kinds of history. I mean, going back to the dark ages even. So, but I, I really love, like I said, glamour. So I'm into you know, 20s and 30s glamour or so, any of that, really. I can almost find a, a jumping off point for any kind of assignment that I'm given or whatever I decide to do. I can find a way to love it. When you said the music inspires you, because you said that you had uh, some uh, music quotes in, in the book. So is it the lyrics or is it the look or what is it about the music that inspires you? 
Uh, well, that particular book, yeah, that was lyrics from Fleetwood Mac. So Fleetwood Mac will not be suing me now because I took them out. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, <laughs> right. Well, those books, uh, the Immortal Confessions books, start in the 1970s, and one of the vampires is a rock musician. And so I really got to delve into that world, um, you know, that back when, you know, the groupies were around and stuff. So that was a lot of fun. Um but I think I lost track of your question. What? what oh, just uh, what about the music is, is that inspires you? Was it? The, uh, I don't know if it was just the lyrics or if it was. Oh, I see. No, I'm really into guitar-driven rock. I love, you know, Jimmy Page and Eric Clapton and Jack White, and so I'm really inspired by that. Um, my dad is a guitarist, so I must have it in my blood, even though I don't actually. Well, I was going to ask if you. <laughs> yeah. So not a musician and not a stand-up, we found out. <laughs> That's right. I, I'm only an admirer. Not yet, anyway. <laughs> There's time. Right, right. So uh, we mentioned uh, womeninhorror.com. Uh, where else can people follow you to see, to see what you're up to? Um, well, I write reviews, uh, movies and book reviews for weliveentertainment.com. And um, I also write for fantasticadaily.com, which is for my non-genre reviews. Um, that's about it right now. I'm also doing a few articles for reallyrather.com, which I'm sure your uh, viewership has zero interest in because it's a lot about fashion and makeup and <laughs> you know interior design. So basically, as a freelance writer, I do so many different kinds of writing that you know, it's really great to be adaptable. But yeah, in terms of horror, I would say womeninhorror.com is the best place to find me. Very good. And uh, Tristan, do you have a last question? Yeah, your partner, Erin, is also an artist, um, uh -huh. a very different kind of artist. And I'm wondering, uh, to what extent do you guys collaborate or offer input into each other's work? Oh, well, we do talk about things when they're in development, you know, just kind of bounce ideas off each other. Like, what do you think of this? Or what do you think of that? But um, the fact that we've both been at it for so long that we're pretty secure <laughs> in, you know, what we do. So, you know, we're not always like looking at each other's stuff, you know, as it's in progress or, you know, offering input because I'm not an artist and he's not a writer, but it actually is a great um, kind of different way to bounce off of somebody because if they do the exact same thing that you do then they might be more opinionated so we're more supportive than opinionated i would say very good well this was very nice to meet you good to meet you that too great having you on yeah, yeah and troy can say a word hi troy how are you doing are you still there? <laughs> i just i usually just listen i Okay. I'm the it's casual not you. Nerd. He's always like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All I right. like a good story. It's just the way <laughs> well, for Troy though. He has some really cool new t-shirt designs without your head. You can check those out without your head.com slash tees. It's the uh, three of us as uh, serial monsters. So check those out. And for the podcast version, uh, we're going to play Zombina and the Skeletones after this interview. It won't be on the uh, YouTube because we might get flagged or anything, but they gave us permission <laughs> to that on the podcast. I can relate. <laughs> right. So thank you. Appreciate this. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so thank much. Thank you, Stacy. Take care. Bye. 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 Thanks, everyone, for watching. Yes, thank you. Bye. Okay. It's always <laughs> awkward at the end. Can I talk? Can I? Yeah. Okay.